Cool. So I think first things first is to um, introduce you to our panel or rather let our panel introduce themselves to you. Um, we've got a fantastic panel today with some kind of really diverse kind of expertise, which we think um, will be really beneficial. And we'll go from left to right. So um, Claire, let's start with, um, with you. Thanks, Ben. Hello, everybody. I'm Claire. Uh, I am a part of the team at Juro. And for those that don't know, Juro is a contract automation platform. So it allows teams to create and execute contracts at scale, as well as managing them, managing workflows around contracts post signature. So one of the big uh, pain points that we help with is uh, people teams who need to generate and negotiate and agree contracts uh, at scale in an automated way to save uh, time and money. Uh, my role particularly is as director of customer success. So uh, I would oversee implementation of the tech and helping teams to get the most out of the platform. But um, also I have a, an interest in this topic as I've been onboarded during this COVID um, situation that we have going at the moment. So a mixture of working through it and experiencing being hired and uh, being onboarded in this type of environment has been very interesting as well. Lovely to meet everybody. Great, thanks Claire. And um, Alex? Yes, hi everyone, I'm Alex. I'm Head of Operations at Contour. Contour helps uh, companies find offices, so we work mostly with other startups and scale-ups, and we do everything from finding one desk in a flexible office all the way to your own headquarter in a leased space. Uh, so obviously for us, this whole COVID situation has been quite interesting because the way we work in offices and the way we use offices has massively changed. Um, so it's going to be interesting to, you know, hear the thoughts of other people, but also give you the insight that we've like collated so far from all the companies that we work with. And uh, let's see also how things keep on developing in 2021, because I'm sure there's loads more to come. Yep, perfect. And Will? Hi, everyone. I'm Will. I'm a partner at a startup called Spill. We are a mental health company and we're trying to make mental health support a lot easier for employees to access. So we make a Slack extension that lets employees book therapy sessions, video therapy sessions with qualified therapists in just three clicks. So we're trying to make it a lot easier for employees to proactively uh, engage with mental health. And uh, we also run quite a lot of workshops that collate a lot of the knowledge of our therapists. So I'm probably going to be here offering an angle into the more psychological and mental health side of the kind of employee life cycle overall. And yeah, excited to get stuck into what's going to be quite an interesting topic, I think. Cool. Brilliant. Thanks very much, everyone. And, um, and what we'll do kind of before we dive into the panel discussion, um, we'll just kind of set the scene a little bit. So I'll run through a few, um, a few slides. Um, I just thought, Ricky, if you can let me know if there are questions, I might not be able to see when I'm screen sharing. So just, um, yeah, give me a little, little shout if so. Um, so I think as we've seen, like over the last kind of eight months, like the world of work and the employment market has been totally turned on its head. Like we've gone from record levels of employment back in March to 9.6 million people being furloughed. Unemployment now being at about 5% and the furlough scheme has been extended until March to prevent mass redundancies. This has caused, as you'd imagine, a lot of anxiety for job seekers and it's really piled pressure on companies that are still hiring uh, who are really struggling to deal with the sheer volume of, of applications and deliver a positive uh, candidate experience. Like we've seen on Tempo uh, upwards of 300% increase in activity against some jobs and there have been numerous reports uh, in the news on the BBC about companies receiving thousands of applications as soon as they put an advert live. Um, so it's it's a really tough time to be on the job market, but also to be hiring as well, because there's, there's challenges for everyone. And this was really interesting in terms of, despite being digital natives, like young people are actually uh, the group struggling most with, with remote work. Um, so the vast majority actually really finding it quite difficult um, 85% of Gen Z feel less connected to their teams when working remotely. And for that generation, I think for all young workers, it's the relationships you form at work are so important. It's really, really hard to build those um, digitally. And many companies at the moment are asking themselves questions like, uh, what do we need for a lot of it in the future? And do we even need an office? Um, some, have, I'm sure we've all seen, have declared themselves 
office free from now on, um, but we've really got to make sure that these decisions are taken, uh, these younger workforce uh, or the younger workforce into consideration um, so they don't get left behind. Uh, and there have been obviously benefits to remote working. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that people are more efficient when working remotely. Um, but it can be really tough because there's a lack of um, kind of accountability. There's a lack of feedback. Uh, it's really easy to be unproductive, uh, maybe unnoticed and miss out on a lot of these really beneficial and kind of rewarding interactions that come uh, in the workplace, like collaboration, feedback, and getting a sense of progress. Um, especially when each day uh, can kind of blur into one um, and it can be really really easy to get distracted and obviously there's been a lot of uh, press about things like zoom fatigue um, and how exhausting it is to interact kind of digitally all day rather than being able to pick up on those uh, kind of non-verbal um, kind of cues and that's kind of bled into what's kind of been suggested as a, a potential kind of mental health crisis um, that's on the horizon because People are struggling massively with increased levels of loneliness, um, isolation, anxiety, and it's really, really hard to know when to switch off. Um, the lines between work and home are obviously increasingly blurry, and that means that, quite shockingly, 77% so of workers say they've experienced burnout in their current job. Um, and although I think there's an increased awareness around mental health in general, and particularly in the workplace, I think a lot of companies just don't know where to start. Um, so there's a a big kind of challenge there in terms of how we align the two expectations and abilities from from kind of employers and their employees. Um, so with all of those kind of challenges um, in mind, I'll stop um, screen sharing and we'll come over to um, to our panel. I thought it would make sense that we've we've spoken a little bit obviously about the the journey that people go through with us kind of as a business. So I thought it makes sense to, to start on that kind of hiring and onboarding piece um, at the beginning of the process and what companies can do to deliver a really great uh, kind of recruitment and onboarding experience. And as you, as you mentioned, Claire, you've been through this kind of recently uh, during the whole kind of COVID situation. So it'd be great to hear your thoughts on, on that. Sure. Uh, yes, I, I have been through. I, I would say I am a, a little luckier in that I did interview uh, in February. So I, I did miss the, the complete lockdown and luckily I was able to meet uh, the majority of the Juro London team over the course of my interview process uh, before going remote for actually working. And unfortunately I've never had the chance to work in the office just yet. Um, but thinking about the whole journey, there are a lot of things that are changing for candidates at, at all levels. And as you mentioned, particularly uh, younger people who are maybe coming into the world of work for the first time or who are in one of their first um, jobs um, out of uni. When I think about what Juro is uh, doing in order to try to make this, uh, remove as much pain from this process as possible, it really does start very early. So long before thoughts of onboarding, the interview process itself is a time where although you are looking at a candidate, the candidate is also looking at your organization and your culture and seeing if it would be a good fit for them. And one thing I see Juro doing is making sure that even though we're not meeting face-to-face, -face, candidates meet a wide variety of representatives from the organization. They don't just meet the hiring manager, but they'll meet, uh, let's say, maybe uh, other team members that they'll be working with, as well as more senior members of the team. And one great practical uh, example that I've seen Juro do is we will run one dedicated interview, which is purely based on uh, company values and cultures. And the person who conducts that interview will be someone who would not necessarily be working directly with the candidate, but is maybe from another department, but still represents the uh, the questions around uh, living by our values and what the culture is like internally, what it's like to work here. It helps the candidate to get a much better view of what's going on and it also allows us to kind of represent ourselves as broadly as possible to try to make up for some of the pieces that are missing there at that early stage of decision making on both sides. Yeah, they make, make sense. And, and Alex and Will, I guess, 
when people are um, going through this like remote onboarding experience where you don't get to meet the team and and Claire luckily you did get to spend some time like, yeah. in the office and the team but when you haven't got to do that or get a feel for like the working environment like what effect can that have on on new employees? I think a really big effect like if we think about this um, from the kind of fundamental psychological point of view how those first experiences and the first feelings we have towards a company then go on to kind of color how we interpret everything that happens to us. It's a bit like how as people, you know, things that happen to us when we're children kind of color how we interpret experiences later in life. If you feel kind of very held and taken care of at the beginning, if you feel connected, if you have a clear sense of direction in those first formative one to two weeks, I really think it then is so important in setting up how you interpret things in future. So say when something small happens, say for example, in week three, you're accidentally left off an invite for a meeting or someone forgets to include you on an email. If you've got that sense of feeling connected and held, you're far, far less likely to interpret that negatively. So I think those first few weeks are really, really important, doing all we can to set out a clear path of what people are gonna be doing over that time, making sure they feel included with things like welcome packs um, and ensuring they're having a lot of one-on-one -on -one time as well with, as Claire says, a different variety of employees as well. And have you seen, Alex, um, a change in the way that companies are, are kind of pitching themselves to, to candidates? Like a big part of it pre-corona would have been around the working environment and the office, but is that still the case? Yeah, I mean, it's a very valid question. And I think that's also one of the things that in terms of the office and talent, I think going fully remote is really good in terms of getting more talent because you're not constrained by geographic limitations. But on the other hand, and I know for me, at least personally, it was like that, the cultural element is also one of the attractions for talent. So when you have several offers you know, available to join a company, meeting the team, going to the office, feeling almost like the vibe that is in there was or is a determining factor for talent joining a certain company. So if you cannot do that physically, it's so important to try to do that virtually. I guess there's different ways of doing that, whether, you know, the ones that Claire and Will mentioned, whether it's, you know, like online interviews with as many people as possible or sending hampers or whatnot. I've heard of other companies doing a lot of like informal coffee catch up. So you get like a meeting that is virtually to replicate that water cooler moment or that informal sort of discussion that sometimes you don't get if you just have, you know, Zoom call people like join, they talk about what they're supposed to talk, the agenda and then leave again. Uh, so yeah, but it's definitely something that companies need to tackle and try to replicate the physical one virtually for the time being. I think one thing we've found as well um, with regards to when employees join virtually, I think I'll, you can still pick up a lot of the information that's explicit. So in the employee handbook or kind of upfront in the contract, but what's a lot harder to pick up on are those kind of unsaid things in the company culture. So kind of, you know, like do people tend to take a full hour for lunch break and what time do people tend to finish and how do we, you know, is it okay to kind of ask a question in the all hands meeting? All of those things that you naturally pick up based on seeing how other employees behave. We're beginning and trying to put together a document that's called kind of like everything people won't tell you at Spill, um, which is designed to sit alongside the more formal documents to help people understand some of those more intangible aspects to the culture. Yeah, and do we think um, when companies are now selling themselves to potential employees, like the way that they think about their culture has changed? Because typically the things you had mentioned would be things that are in the office or activities that happen as a group and as a team, like social events and lunches and ping pong, whatever it might be. Has there been a shift, you think, in how companies are perceiving their own culture? Uh, I've certainly always seen uh, there, there can be pitfalls when companies are talking about their own culture and you can see that the the existence of bean bags or a pool table can sort of stand in sometimes for the the more meaningful connections that people are having in their roles um, I've seen uh, at Juro and at other companies more of a more of a focus on thinking about mental health and being deliberate in the way we talk about uh, employee happiness and mental health so looking at ways that the culture can, instill that uh, probably in a more practical way than before. 
Uh, and I can see that mattering to candidates more now as well, as they think about perhaps their next role, what is really important to them in terms of a sense of belonging and in terms of um, their mental health being taken care of by their employer and holding it uh, in, a, in a higher um, point of order than they did it before. Yeah, I definitely agree. I think um, often those things like, you know, ping pong, free beers, bean bags, kind of are on one hand standing in for culture and on the, other, on the other hand, you know, at their worst kind of being implicit encouragements for people to stay past dinner time every evening, which is fundamentally not something that is good for any of us in the long run or necessarily good for overall workforce productivity. So I think we've seen slightly more of a shift maybe away from those kind of tangible benefits and more towards uh, a, a greater feeling of kind of support. I think we know what people fundamentally want from work is not kind of necessarily money and benefits uh, when you get to those higher stages. It's that feeling of being supported, ample room for feedback, for growth. So I think we've maybe seen more of a focus on those kind of core psychological benefits rather than just the kind of exact things like beanbags and free beers. And, and Alex, so if we are seeing this shift away from, I guess, a physical connection to the office, but also this less tangible uh, connection around like the company's identity being associated with the office and the culture being associated with the office. I mean, lots of people have asked themselves over the last few months, like what is the future of the office? Um, so no pressure, but, but please tell us um, what that is. <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I think I can give you my point of view and what we've seen so far, but as I mentioned already in the introduction, I think things are still gonna develop. And I, I do think, you know, when March came and everyone went fully remote, everyone was super excited, like, oh, this is great. You know, I wake up just five minutes before my meeting and I can have yoga in the middle of the day and everyone was super happy about it. And then maybe two or three months in of just being stuck at home, the sentiment started really shifting of being like, oh, well, now I've been home quite a bit and like, oh, I'm getting a bit, you know, frustrated by it and all these Zoom calls and Zoom quizzes and whatnot, like maybe, you know, it's time for something else. So I, I still think like it's going to develop. What we've seen so far from like the different companies that we work with is that the ones that have gone completely office free are usually the slightly smaller ones. So for us, it was mostly companies that were below 10 employees. For everyone that is slightly larger, so 10 employees plus, we've seen, well, actually different approaches. One th that I call the, well, the hub and spoke. So essentially they have like a central hub and then different offices around to alleviate the commuting times for the people living a little bit further from the office. Another one is just keeping the office as a central hub, but making it smaller. So let's say a company of 100 employees, they wouldn't take 100 fixed desks. They would rather opt for an office that is around like 50 to 60, which allows, you know, for rotation. So people come in, you know, whenever on rotation. So no one is in at the same time, but also it helps the people who are into like sit next to each other sometimes. Another time they sit next to someone else, which is great. And then there's like the third approach of companies who say, well, we just want to keep the office as is the same size maybe space it out a little bit more, but like keep it. And um, one thing though that I do see a lot is that people want to come to the office to collaborate and to meet and to be together. So there's a lot of meeting rooms that are required, a lot of you know social interaction space that is getting built into the new offices. Yeah, interesting. And does that, um, does that mirror your approaches? Can I Claire and Will, I guess, well, you're probably at the, the smaller end, Jiro, beginning to approach the point where you might feel like you need an office on that central hub. You go ahead, Will. Yeah, I think um, contrastingly, yeah, COVID and lockdown, I think, has basically just sold me the concept of the office and what reminded me why it existed in the first place. Um, so I'm very kind of pro office at the moment. You're right, we're a team of 13. So we're probably, Alex, in that smaller end of the spectrum where we do still feel like we really need um, that physical time together as we're starting to kind of cement the culture and there's lots of kind of cross-departmental work uh, going along. I think you're right that we'll probably be looking in the future, but it's made us basically have a lot of discussions about what really is the problem that we want the office to solve. And I think one is just kind of a feeling of connection and socializing. Perhaps some of that could be done through having more team social events that don't need to be in an office. But that second part really is collaboration, the chance to kind of overhear what someone else is working on and chip in, 
the chance to kind of spot a problem earlier. And for that, I think we definitely will be perhaps taking up that model of more time in like meeting rooms in sub teams um, and kind of spreading that amongst people. Um, that seems to be what people kind of are looking for going forward. Uh, I, I would certainly agree with, with Alex that it's, I think it's still being formed. I, I think we're still unsure of, of what the future will be on this topic. Uh, we, I've seen uh, a lot of organizations do um, uh, sort of surveys of their, of their workforce to see where, where the thinking is. I, I know for Juro, it was a mixed bag. I think the, the general consensus is that a flexible situation would be great, maybe like two days per week uh, per person in an office. Um, that seemed to be a common one. But something that you mentioned, Ben, earlier is that it's not really evenly distributed. Um, it's not that everyone feels the same way. Um, younger people who are really keen to get back living in the city, meeting people all the time, are, are a little keener, I think, to go to uh, back to normality than someone who has the ability to, you know, be out in the countryside or, or take that opportunity to be with kids or, or be away from the city. So um, remains to be answered, I think, but it's something that I see a lot of organizations checking in with employees on on a regular basis to try to get a better view of what they think. Yeah. And it, yeah, it ties into, so that point around like 89% of Gen Z saying they're really struggling to work from home. Obviously, we've seen a really rapid shift, at least in the short term, towards remote working and home working. But if there are companies kind of on, on the call that have committed to being office free in the long run, what can they do to make sure that their younger employees aren't disadvantaged by that shift to remote working? Mm. Yeah, that's a very valid like question because especially for younger employees, the importance of the office is so great because they're like building their career and their career progression is so much quicker or like they're at the onset. And I've read so many articles around how actually when you're young, you learn a lot by almost osmosis or by imitating people or like seeing, oh, actually this is the end product, but the process to get there, they did this and that, or whether it's the language that you know your manager or your mentor uses and whatnot. And it's very, very difficult to replicate these sort of things non-physically. So that's definitely something that companies will have to, you know, try to tackle and address as they go more and more virtually. Yeah, I think we've, you, I totally agree with all those points, Alex. I think so much of what you learn is on the job and it's by being around people. We're trying to like find ways that we can, I guess, spin this and try and make it sometimes a positive one way. One thing I think is great about all this time spent on calls is that, you know, sometimes you can ask people to record a call and that can be a really great kind of training and learning initiative for a junior person, whether that's a sales call or a user interview. Um, some great opportunities, I think, to do that. Also, something we've tried is doing kind of job shadowing as a screen share. So just kind of watching a senior person as they go about doing a specific task, be that like specific things like development or just kind of project management and how they work through a spreadsheet. I think there's still opportunity to do that kind of virtual over the shoulder moment for someone more senior, even if you're not literally in the same space as them. Yeah, yeah, I agree. I think um, what we've seen is right, it takes a lot more thought to do that stuff. Um, and you've mm. got to try really hard to take into account even things like different personality types, like some people that will come up and grab you and ask for help and others that you really need to practically go out and, and find them. Um, which it's as say when you're physically with people it's much more obvious um if people need help but also to like just go in and help um because you're kind of physically close to them so i think it's a big a big challenge and it kind of links into the the next bit actually that i want to talk about which is around kind of engagement and kind of well-being in general i think we've had a lot of feedback um from companies that engagement is a huge struggle i think as we've spoken about everyone being a little bit bored of like zoom quizzes and zoom calls and like every day kind of feeling um feeling the same that tied into a large large number of people experiencing burnout because they're struggling to um kind of turn off in the in the evening so like what can companies do to try and like increase engagement um and make sure that people are are still okay at home there's a I guess there's there's a, a balance to try to uh, strike between uh, 
making sure that there is a good amount of connection and, and avoiding this Zoom fatigue or, or this sort of like a burnout from just being on camera all day. And I see a lot of great innovative ideas coming out around that, um, helping people to connect without it being centered on uh, heads down work, you know, helping people to connect with people that they work with without it being in a really pressured delivery environment. So I think we mentioned already things like coffee um, chats, which can be set up in Slack. So you're randomly paired with, with someone. Uh, uh, at Juro, we do twice weekly meditation where we have a, a calm subscription. And so twice weekly at midday, anyone who um, wants to take 15 minutes can dial in and we'll have a, a guided meditation, as well as uh, some of the, the Zoom quiz type styles. But I've seen much more create much more creativity coming into those interactions since, since the days in March of three quizzes a week. Um, we'll do some interesting engagements around getting to know each other. Uh, one of my team put on a quiz, um, guess what height everyone in the company is or put these people in, in, in order of height. So there's trying to bring people together in a way that they're uh, connecting, but it's not necessarily that high pressure performance uh, type interaction. I would love to hear other people's um, solutions to that one as well. I love the the height quiz because I remember <laughs> that's one of the things even you know all the online classes and whatever whenever I saw the person in real life the impression was very different from like video so I love that I mean um yeah so very interesting points are also about the calm meditation app that's maybe something we want to we should implement as well and uh, what we've done is we've tried and again it's very difficult to like keep the balance between not just talking about work but also about personal stuff without interfering too much or having almost the pressure that people feel that they need to constantly you know chat back or like what's up back or whatnot and um, so what we've done which apparently is quite successful is I think it's called Strava the running club so essentially they're all in a group and they can go for runs whenever they want and then they can you know almost like compete against each other but like they're isolated but um similar things such as yoga classes where you know the same person is there and you see each other's names or even the camera which works really well um so these sort of things but i guess another thing that is very important and i try to always like push for is to make sure that we're not expecting people to be on demand all the time because there are people who like to work early in the morning but then actually want to like work out let's say from 11 to 12 and there's other people who just want to work and stop working at, I don't know, 5, 6 p.m. and then have like the family time. So we use a lot like calendars to see when people are on and off just to, you know, respect a little bit the privacy or like the private time and, you know, when it's work and when it's not. Yeah, I think that's a really good point you touch on, Alex, which is um, this kind of recognition that everyone is different. And I think the calendar is so important right now. I think it's so easy for us to feel overwhelmed and get that sense of being out of control when we're just getting kind of meetings coming into our diary. So I think doing things like blocking out your calendar, you know, when you have an afternoon of work, you need to do blocking out, even putting on an out of office. Um, so every Wednesday at Spill, we do something called Deep Work Wednesday, where everyone has an out of office on, there's no internal meetings. And that's just your chance to kind of do work, like an actual task that you're super engaged in. Also stuff like um, changing your Slack status. So, you know, changing it to a dog if you're out on a dog walk, changing it to something food related if you're having lunch, um, you know, a little running icon if you're out on a run. Like you're saying, Alex, people like to arrange their days differently and simple ways we can help people give those signals um, really can help uh, people kind of look out for each other a little bit more. Yeah, and I think, yeah, it's definitely been a challenge with um, that time management bit well is that now you can do calls back to back all day if you wanted to. Like um, if you could do three client meetings, as an example, kind of pre-COVID, now technically you could do seven or eight in a day like, if you wanted to. So that like, yeah, respect for one another's time in terms of not like packing stuff in, I think is um, it's something that everyone's kind of getting used to, um, which is yeah, massively important. And what about on a more, um, on the more kind of, I guess, work oriented bit? Because if work's migrated from being not just the the day job and the activity and your output, it's all this other stuff wrapped around it, which has now been stripped away. How can 
people make sure they're still providing that fulfillment, I guess, from the work um, that their employees are doing and, and the feedback and sense of progression. I'm happy to talk about this maybe more from a kind of uh, mental health and burnout point of view. Um, I think, yeah, burnout's one of the things we've seen rise so much. It's like tripled instances of it that we've seen on Spill since um, March. And one of the things that's interesting about burnout is we kind of think it's just about how much work we have, but actually the link between that and burnout is not very strong. It's more down to your kind of psychological relationship with work. Um, and as you mentioned, um, one of the really important things is the feeling that we get of making meaningful progress towards goals. If we could have that feeling that we're progressing towards the right goals, we can actually withstand quite a lot of work. Equally, people can burn out on like 20 hours a week of work if they don't have that feeling of progression. Um, so making sure that really we have like the right goals for us, that they're achievable enough, they're broken down and small enough. People are clear on what the shared goals are. I think now more than ever, it's harder to pick that stuff up by osmosis, as Alex said. So we have to be kind of super clear. And I think line managers here are a really, really kind of vital asset and working with making sure line managers are supported so that they can then help employees with things like goal setting and feedback as well. Does that um, mirror what you think? Sorry, go on. Uh, goal setting is, is an interesting one. It, it just reminds me of a, of a great um, approach that I heard. Um, when we talk about setting quarterly goals, um, the people can be obviously very results focused and they can be driving themselves to, to meet these targets and, and putting themselves under pressure. Um, one uh, piece of advice that management can be really open about is the fact that targets are set on the expectation that X number of days leave are taken per quarter. So if you have a, you know, an annual um, allowance of say 25 days leave, then taking five or six in a quarter is built into your targets. And that, that should be part of your structure when you're looking at your quarter. And if that can come from leadership in a meaningful way, it um, is much more likely to be taken on board by, by employees and actually adopted and make sure people are taking that far in our time when they do need it. That, I think that's such an important point, Claire. And I think one of the things we've seen is just like people have not taken as much holiday this year. It, I guess, feels, you know, more difficult if you can't go abroad or people feel guilty about it. There's a lot wrapped up there. And uh, we had this at Spill. No one took a day of holiday between February and May. And we had to basically yeah. enforce a minimum quarterly holiday uh, allowance, um, which did work in terms of getting people to do it, but then actually there was a lot of pushback saying it felt slightly too dictatorial. Um, so what we've moved to now is that we now track percent of holidays days taken as like a company OKR. So in our company in general, like things get done and focused on if they are a company objective. So we now have a company objective, which is like team health and we measure percent of holiday days taken. Um, and to incentivize everyone, if people take 100% of their holiday days in a year, we give everyone a 50 pound Skyscanner voucher for next year. So we're trying to be a bit more tangible. Because I think if you, if you say, please take your holiday, it will always slip to the bottom of the agenda if, as Claire says, you have other tangible results that are gonna take precedence. Yeah, yeah, I think that's definitely mirrored what we've seen as well in terms of, uh, there's been challenges like for the business and the individuals in their roles, which then makes you feel like you need to double down and do more work, where actually the exact thing you need to do is take some time off. <laughs> so it's like really counterintuitive and it's almost not pitching it as like holiday, it's just time off and it's like laptop away and, and not looking at your emails for a few days or a week or whatever. Because um, yeah, the year's gone so quickly that it's quite easy to forget that it's been eight months and you might not have had any kind of break at all. Um, so yeah, it's super, super important. And, and how, like, how are people finding, like, Will, you're probably quite biased towards this, but how are people finding um, those conversations? Are there more conversations happening around kind of mental health and well-being in general? Like, do we think COVID's prompted a lot of that stuff because people are, are kind of more aware of it? Or is it still a challenge to, to find out when stuff's wrong? I think definitely something that people are a bit more aware of and it became a bit more acceptable to talk about it. And uh, I do also think certain things such as the furlough 
brought out a lot of emotions in a lot of people. So it's especially important now to, you know, make sure that people are mentally supported, that they're in a mental state that is actually all right. And um, also for me, like what I've observed is the increase in anxiety just because there was so much uncertainty. So what's going to happen? You know, job security was asked. People, you know, were stuck at home. Countries were locked down. So it's definitely from the experience I've seen much more acceptable and almost much more a requirement to make sure that people in the organization are mentally like all right and dealing with all the extra stimulus that are out there that can negatively impact them at this well during the last eight months more than ever yeah yeah i think the um the thing that brought it home to me i guess in terms of it's being it's not just working from home it's all these other things was someone saying like no one alive has ever lived through a pandemic before yeah. so it's like a new experience for everyone it's like all these unique challenges um combined with all the the other pressures that exist day to day anyway it's like it's more than okay to to not be okay um at the moment and just to kind of get talking about it um and how so well to bounce this to you there was that stat earlier was about the 70 percent of the people experiencing burnout and 69 percent of those thinking their company isn't doing enough to help so how how can we address that yes very good question um, I think there's a lot of stuff that can be done at a company level. I think we've talked about a bit already, like encouraging people to take more ownership of their diaries, encouraging managers to be quite defensive over their team's diaries, things like holiday and respecting, you know, clear cutoffs after a certain time in the evening. I think one of the broader things that companies can try and do is just to kind of lead by example on a culture of more vulnerability. One of the things that makes burnout worst is when we feel like we have to live up to this standard of execution or perfection um, and where we feel like we can't, you know, open up about things that have gone wrong. I think there's this tech is weird because, you know, one of the big tech phrases is move fast and break things. But often it doesn't we don't actually mean it. Um, and it's still not really a safe space to say, sorry, I deleted loads of stuff from the database or whatever it might be. Um, so actually having some people in a prominent position in the company who talk openly about shortcomings. Um, one way we've tried to help prompt this is at the beginning of the week when we have like a stand up, um, we ask senior people to talk about like what they did do and also what they didn't manage to do last week, just to make it easier for people to talk. It doesn't just become about wins. It's obviously great psychologically to support wins, but I think we need to balance out by also being honest about the things that we weren't able to do or the things that we didn't do so well at. Yeah. Yeah, totally agree. Um, cool. And one um, question which is slightly related to this, um, but slightly, I think it's just something that people will be interested in. Obviously, normally uh, the Christmas party is a huge occasion for like businesses to come together and celebrate the year and um, and most likely kind of get a bit drunk. Um, that's really not going to happen in its normal sense this year. So what what is everyone doing for the Christmas party? I'm curious yeah. to know. Uh, it's a big question. It's a big, big <laughs> question uh, yeah, for, for us at the moment. Um, I guess we, we are always making decisions based on government guidelines at the time and uh, trying to be realistic about where things are going to be in a few weeks time. Uh, I know that the people team is uh, planning a surprise uh, that will be uh, something, something physical in the post as a sort of a, a celebration uh, and something that we can enjoy together. Um, unfortunately, I, I think it would be probably too hopeful to think that we'll all be together somewhere, uh, but building that sense of celebration for the end of the year coming is something that's really important. So finding a way to do that um, remotely and everyone loves getting presents in the post. <laughs> yeah, that's a really nice idea. I think we, yeah, I think a bit like um, Claire, obviously depends on the guidelines, but we're probably going to be doing stuff in smaller groups. Um, I don't think that's always necessarily a bad thing. Um, there's this uh, thing known as like dinner party effect, which is when you take four people and you add a fifth person to the conversation, in general, the conversation then tends to break up into smaller groups. So around four is actually kind of the maximum number of people you would ever talk to at once at a party anyway. So I think we're thinking of doing something on Zoom where you kind of have breakout rooms where you mix up between four people and you have some like kind of 
funny questions or interesting conversation starters to go through. Um, and then we might all come together at the end and do like a silly awards ceremony where we kind of have tinfoil awards and dress up and kind of reminisce upon things during the year. Um, but I think, yeah, we're trying to think about it in that lens of, you know, if you went to a party, you couldn't talk to everyone at the same time anyway. So maybe doing stuff in smaller groups is not necessarily the worst thing. Yeah, great ideas, actually. I'm like taking notes. <laughs> <laughs> great stuff. So for us, to be fair, I, I feel like we're currently in absolute denial. We're like, yeah, let's see. Hopefully, like the office is open again. <laughs> no, no, no. So we haven't started planning, but um, I, I'm like collating information, getting feedback. I've heard of people sending hampers. I've heard of people doing the Christmas party, like jumpers on Zoom. So um, yeah, I think probably something in the post maybe I'm not sure hopefully no one from the team is listening so they'll be like I'll be spending the surprise but yeah we'll have to think of something yeah I don't even know what ours is I'm not privy to such important <laughs> information um we've got a little bit of um I think we've got some Christmas jumper action going on but apart from that I am oblivious um cool all right well good to know that we're not the only ones struggling to solve that conundrum um and to kind of wrap up just before we, we go to questions, uh, what would each of yours kind of number one tip be um, to give companies to make sure that they're, they're kind of taking the right steps into 2021? I think um, th thinking about 2021 and sort of everyone's hopefully looking towards the end of Q4 now and, and looking towards planning the, the next year, um, I see probably the most important thing for companies to do being is that they need to ask uh, so uh, look at employees and ask them how they can be there or how they can help to avoid all the topics we've been talking about today and help make the situation easier I see a great way of doing that be uh, being through an employee engagement survey and that's the kind of thing you can run once per quarter and track problem areas and um, like areas that you're doing well in, as long as that asking is followed up with a set of actions. So make sure that you're uh, getting a good insight into what is happening with your employees and then demonstrate how you're using that information to improve the situation overall would be my advice. Nice. I think mine would be um, to kind of take advantage of this situation as an excuse for us all to talk more openly about our feelings and vulnerabilities. I think in general, you kind of alluded to this, Ben, that it's quite hard, you know, it's quite hard to ask someone like, how are you doing really? But if we shift the focus away to the person we ask, you know, how's lockdown going? It's an easy catalyst to then start to talk about things around that. So if you've been feeling lonely, if you're feeling trapped. So I think trying to lean in a bit to uh, the challenge that we're facing. And hopefully if anything good comes of it, it will be that it will be easier for all of us to show a more kind of vulnerable side, ideally starting with senior leadership and then kind of permeating throughout the organization and the culture. I, I love those two uh, suggestions. I'm going to implement them as well. Um, I think mine would be, and I guess every company has been affected differently or not, but being in the office search sector is not the best time at the moment. And I think my suggestion for 2021 would be almost to stay optimistic and know that also this crisis will pass. And instead of almost like trying to, you know, swim against the stream and like, you know, be super like worried about it, just almost, you know, accept that sometimes things don't go very well and make the best of it, whether it means, you know, having a bit more time for yourself or, you know, having more time to work out or having more time to reflect on your life or, you know, taking steps towards improving your mental health and knowing that like it will pick up again and just trying to keep that optimism and not tr spiral into worry and, you know, hypotheses of what's going to happen next, etc. Nice. And you're a nice positive note. Love it. Um, cool. Brilliant. Well, no, thanks so much everyone for that. Super insightful. Um, what we can do now is open it up for uh, for questions. So if anyone's got any questions that they uh, want to ask, feel free to either put them in the chat or just pop your um, kind of microphone and camera on. Um, oh, and right on cue, a question from Ed. Um, Ed, do you want to ask the question or would you like me to? Hi there, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just wondering 
kind of if you had any suggestions around new joiners um obviously it can feel a little bit overwhelming kind of bringing them on and having lots of individual one-to-ones on zoom etc so i just wondered your thoughts kind of around that yeah this is a good question i think one thing we've tried to do is to break down i guess kind of week by week uh initiating them into the culture and kind of maybe giving a slight uh, purpose to each of those one-to-one so that it's not just 10 one-to-one chats about how you're feeling which can be quite intimidating so maybe the first one is you know and it's also nice to have a kind of a, the excuse of a topic because it gives you something to focus on so maybe you know the first one the person explains to you how all the slack channels work the second one is about you know going through the internal filing system there's always some, a kind of goal to the meeting um, but really it's an excuse through that to kind of allow you to connect with that person. Um, But yeah, giving kind of clear goals week by week in terms of what needs to be done. So the first week, for example, might just be your only goal is to kind of understand the basics of the company. Making that clear allows you to do it in steps so that that new joiner is not overwhelmed and feels like they need to get up to speed straight away and be, you know, hit the ground running on a lot of projects. So I think being super clear about stepped expectations can be really helpful. Um, I I would echo the same thing about stepped expectations. Um, One one way that I've seen of uh, eliminating that first morning, uh, like onslaught of a million introductions uh, is that new joiners have joined us on our Friday Zoom call for like an end of day beer, just to come and say hi before they start on on the Monday morning. And then over the course of their first sort of two, three weeks, Uh, as well as say being introduced to team leads to learn more about their roles, there'll be smaller challenges set for new joiners. So for example, um, speak to Sana who runs our social media and uh, get featured on the LinkedIn feed or um, meet at least one pet that belongs to someone at Joro. And it causes them to have uh, a little bit more of an outreach that's not all focused on uh, on sort of pressured situations, but is a little bit more social like it would be in an office. Great, yeah, similar points as the ones mentioned by Claire and Will. And uh, what we usually do is buddy someone up. So um, that's what we've done in the past. We haven't had a new joiner join just yet, but I guess that could even work very well now. So they just have like an informal person they can ask questions without feeling you know too pressured or whatnot. Cool, great. Um, and had a question through uh, privately as well, just saying, if you're if you're concerned about your company's prospects going into 2021, how can you broach this with your your with your boss or manager? So I guess that's a, a kind of a, a psychological safety question. Um, yes, um, I would say the best forum is in a kind of one-to-one. I think that should always be the role of a one-to-one uh, that's not about performance. It's just about emotional issues and it's the chance to bring up anything that's kind of on your mind. Um, I think that is designed to be like a fully safe space where you can share stuff that is not going to be about your role, your goals and your performance. And it, at its best should be that space where you can feel free to ra- raise stuff like that Uh, safe in the knowledge that that person is going to be listening, trying to understand you um, and not trying to kind of uh, rate your performance in any way. Any other thoughts, Claire and Alex? Um, I think, as you mentioned, the one-on-one, maybe if you do have like informal coffee catch-ups, maybe mention it there. Um, We try for managers, line managers, and even our founders, they try to speak with the guys of the team almost like once a week or once a month to just make sure that everyone is all right and have a bit of that you know space where certain things can be discussed um but even if that isn't the case i would just literally ask for a coffee because everyone is always very happy to like have a coffee and it can be anything from like a hello to actually i'm very worried about like the future but like i guess communication is always one of the things i would advocate for I think also quite a nice way to do it that we sometimes do is to like personify the company. Um, so we have this meeting uh, once a month, which is just called How's Spill Feeling? And uh, it's the same thing, right? It might be quite a direct question to ask your manager, like, do you think the business will survive next year? But if you just ask, you know, how's Juro feeling? How's Tempo feeling? 
and you think a bit about you know the financial state whether you're hiring the wider market employees it's makes it a bit broader uh, and a bit easier to start that conversation without it feeling quite as accusatory yeah question on that on that um meeting will is that something that's uh, shared with the whole business like uh, like the outcomes of that meeting and how spill is feeling is that something that's that's shared among everyone Yes, so we have um, like a minutes uh, document and then we have an actions document as a result of that, which um, is public. I guess because we're smaller, we're 13 people, it's a lot easier for us to do this stuff because it still does feel quite intimate. Um, so yeah, who knows whether it will still be able to happen as we grow, but I think some, yeah, some avenue to discuss stuff more openly about the business uh, in what feels like a safe space, I think will always be needed. Nice. Well, um, anyone else got any questions from the group? Speak now or forever hold your <laughs> peace. Um, uh, cool. In that case, I think we'll we'll wrap up. But um, yeah, thanks so much to Claire, Alex, and Will. Um, really, really useful discussion. I think some tangible kind of takeaways um, that we can use as well, which is brilliant. Um, and yeah, thanks everyone uh, so much for coming. And, and hopefully, we'll see you at the uh, the next one that we do of these. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ben. Enjoy your day. Thanks.